Good morning, Astronomy 1010. Uh, welcome to your first lecture, uh, which is going to be online until February 14th, as you probably know, due to uh, COVID and our high Omicron cases. Uh, this class is going to be a mixture of two sections of the day class, and I've also invited students from my night class to join so that I can consolidate all of my live lecturing into a, sort of one party here. So some of you are in the day class, some of you are in the night class, and uh, uh, at some point we should be going back to in-person classes so you'll get the full experience. Until then, right here on the old uh, rusty, dusty, dry erase board is where we're gonna do our business. Uh, show of hands, how many of you are in the night class? Do I have any night students who actually could make it to this? Anyone in the troll factory or? I guess you guys are all the daytime students. All right. Uh, so before we get started here, uh, I wanna sort of take us over to our, our PowerPoint presentation, function F5, there we go. Um, and so, you know, Lionel knows the drill because he's taking my, uh, my other course, the other version of, of the class that I teach. But for you new friends that I have, I'd like to ask if you guys know what the difference is between astronomy and astrology, because that's something that we have to get straight uh, right out of the starting gate here. Someone want to talk to me? Astrology. Is astrology the type of thing that you find in the horoscope columns, whereas astronomy is more like serious study of the stars, the planets, and all that? That's pretty good, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, astrology is, is what you read about in your horoscope column or on your co-star, as the kids do it. Um, and that's right. Astronomy is uh, a slightly more serious uh, discipline. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be taking some notes during the course of these lectures. And for anyone who's not familiar with Zoom or, uh, you know, how these classes run, in, in a Zoom meeting, you've got a little button on the upper right that says view. You can toggle between the Hollywood Squares view, where we can see everyone, and uh, you then can, then can toggle to speaker view to see who's talking. But I think if you double click on my face, you can go into locked speaker view, and that will be really great for you guys for note taking here, so you can see my board. The recordings follow my controls, so I can use a little artistry there, but, but you guys who are watching live might want to go to locked speaker view for notes. Um, every time I write something down on the board, it'd be a pretty good idea for you guys to write that down as well, all right? Our first discussion of the day is about astronomy versus astrology. And Daniel's contribution was to mention uh, the horoscopes, uh, where he mentioned astronomy is sort of a serious uh, study of, and what would you say? A serious study of what, Daniel? Um, like the stars, the planets, all the, all the stuff that we see in the night sky. That's right. Stars, planets, galaxies. We can include uh, nebula or nebulae. Hell. The whole damned universe is part of the study of astronomy, isn't it? Which is pretty epic because why the universe is the totality of all the things that there are in the, in the physical world, in the physical universe. And so that means the ast astronomy is really the study of everything. Um, <clears throat> here's how I like to think about things. This is what your everyday astrologer looks like. This is a picture of an astrologer, okay? And uh, the message of astrology is, is like this. Everything's gonna be great, you will be rich, okay? So this is what astrologers like to say to you. Um, on the other hand, here's a picture of what your everyday astronomer looks like. This is Edwin Hubble looking cool with his pipe there at the Mount Palomar Observatory. He was famous for discovering the expansion of the universe by studying the velocities of galaxies. Astronomers have a different message for you, and it goes like this. 
we are all going to die when the sun enters its red giant phase. So you can see that the message of astronomy is not quite as uplifting as the message of astrology. That's one of the first differences you notice between the two things. Um, you can read about these subjects in different kinds of periodicals. You can read about astrology in a magazine like Dell Horoscope, okay? And uh, you can, you can you pick this up while you're checking out your frozen peas at the supermarket in the magazine rack. And there's all kinds of important things to learn about, like balancing your mind, body, and spirit. Uranus moves into Pisces. Expect the unexpected, right? Okay, so that's where you read about uh, astrology. Like you read about it uh, in, a, in a magazine blurb or, or in a newspaper column, or maybe even on your CoStar app. Um, you read about articles in astronomy in a slightly more expensive magazine. This is an example of a peer reviewed journal like Science or Nature or the Astrophysical Journal is another prestigious journal dedicated to astronomy. When you wanna publish something in a magazine like this, you first have to go out and you have to do something. You have to take a telescope and you have to collect some photons from outer space. And then you have to develop a hypothesis and test the theory. And when you're done, you need to write up your results in a, in a paper and submit it to a body of enemy professors who are out to get you. And only after your enemy professors have, have combed through it looking for any little detail to get you on, will they begrudgingly allow you to publish your crazy theory about the universe in a magazine like this. So what we would say is that the threshold for publication in a magazine like Science is higher than the threshold for publication in Dell Horoscope. After all, what is the threshold of publication for Dell Horoscope, right? I'd imagine that you might walk into the editor's office with an energy crystal on your forehead and you might say, bro, I'm deeply in touch with the stars. And the editor would say, 20 cents a word, your deadline's due Monday, I love it. Okay, so that's probably the threshold for publication in a magazine like Dell Horoscope. They're also differently priced, right? So this thing might cost you, what, $2.50, right? And, you know, a subscription to nature or science, that's gonna run you hundreds of dollars so much that you're embarrassed to admit it and you have your academic institution pay for you. Um, and you get what you pay for. The quality of information is not the same in these two periodicals, my friends. So why do people get these things confused? Maybe because they, oh, thank you. You know what I love about the pandemic? You know what I love about teaching from home? Coffee on delivery. Oh yeah, okay. There are perks to this, this pandemic. I like right. that I can just get up and make popcorn okay. whenever I want. It's kind of amazing, right? I don't know how we're ever going back. It's, yeah, like tea break is like in my kitchen. It's wonderful. You just have to have the appropriate snacks and you can weather any sort of situation. Hey, All right. What? Oh, um, <laughs> for those folks in the background who are new to the whole Zoom thing, um, I love it when you guys chime in and contribute. You don't have to raise your hand, just shout in any old time. I like a little bit of chaos, but if you're not trying to uh, contribute, you may want to uh, mute yourself just so we don't hear you fighting with your kids or you know feeding your dog or whatever the hell you guys heavy are. Heavy breathing into the mic. Yeah, that's true. Too. Yeah, heavy breathing into the mic. Only I get to do that. All right. Um, uh, wait, show non-video participants. I'm getting better at this here. Uh, hold on. Let me find the offender who probably doesn't even know. I see you got over the focus issues. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yesterday was such a disaster. I had... I had, Lionel, I had so many dumb Zoom issues, and now I feel like back in the saddle. Cowboy's ready to party. I see. <laughs> Josh, Josh okay. Dillon is the offender. Josh Dillon, like shame on you. will be a normal thing. Yeah, exactly. I swear, I'm just going to buy one of those plug-in webcams at this point. Yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're, you know, they can be acquired. You can sometimes get CCRI to let you borrow one if you give them a, Poor me story. They might be able to supply you with one. Oh, did I say oh, that? Oh, a sob story? story? Cool. All right. <laughs> Anyways, um, back to the action here. Uh, why do people get astrology and astronomy confused? Well, because they have to do with some similar things superficially, right? So here's a depiction of your horoscope. 
you know what this is. These are your signs, right? Uh, Sagittarius, Taurus, Capricornus. I know you all know about this because you talked to me about it when we're out drinking at the bar. Okay, you asked me what my sign is, all right? Uh, you'll notice that a modern horoscope has 12 or maybe 13 signs, but these aren't just signs in your co-star. These are real bona fide constellations on the nighttime sky. And if you include Ophiuchus, that means there are 13 signs of the so-called zodiac, okay? These are the constellations uh, that make up the, the horoscope where you, where you do your devil worshiping, okay? Now, there are many more than 13 constellations on the nighttime sky. Um, now, the number of stars in the universe is not infinite. The number of constellations is certainly not infinite. And the reason why is you're here on Earth, and Earth is a sphere, and you can only look out into so many directions into the nighttime sky. You can kind of look to the left or to the right, to the north or to the south. And uh, I don't suppose anyone knows the number of constellations in the nighttime sky. Maybe Lionel, who's taking my 1020 course, remembers the number of constellations in the nighttime sky. Lionel, what did we learn? See, this is what happens when you take both courses. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be calling on you to demonstrate your expertise. Do you know anything? Uh, 88. Hey, all right. Lionel, you're cool. You passed my test. 88 constellations on the so-called celestial sphere. You're gonna be learning about this in good time, okay? So, ah, here we go. Does anyone out there know why astrologers only care about 13 out of 88 constellations? Why don't I, why, don't, why can't my sign be Orion? When someone asks me what my sign is, why can't I say Vulpecula? That's the sign that I identify with. And are you going to oppress me in these modern times? I don't think so, right? Why, why those 13? Does anyone out there know? Anyone who worships astrology know why those 13 are special? Isn't it because the um like it all of it, it's like Gemini, Pisces, uh kind of Hey Josh Duggan, I know you. Yeah, I was in your class last semester. <laughs> yeah, you, you took the uh the uh stellar system component. Yeah, I did. Dude, welcome back. It's great to hear you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yep. Yeah. All right, so you're you're naming off constellations, Josh, but why are those constellations special? What have you learned? Um, didn't they coincide with the uh, months of like each kind of? It's not really about the months. It's not like Sagittarius is. Well, okay, no, uh, sorry. They there is a connection between the months, but you're missing the key freaking connector. From, from what I wrote down yesterday, the reason why astrologers our astrologers only care for twelve is because the sun's locations, location against the background stars. On your beat, on your beat, they will determine your personality type. That's what I took down yesterday. Okay, so that's the premise here. Let's go to note taking mode here. What we're talking about, let's learn some vocab terms here. We're talking about either the twelve or thirteen constellations of the zodiac. There's your first ten dollar vocabulary word but 12 or 13 constellations of the Zodiac. Um, let's take a peek at one of my other slideshows. I really got to put this one into my opening here. Uh, somewhere in here, bear, bear with me, y'all, while I fiddle. Uh, there's a slide showing you, here we go, 56, function F5, 56. Okay, boom. As Earth orbits around the sun, it does so on a quasi-circle we call the ecliptic. Here, the ecliptic is shown as a green ring going around the sun, and that green ring is just the path that Earth makes as it orbits the sun. That ecliptic path, that circle in space, maintains a roughly fixed orientation. Actually, that's a lie, but just forget about that for a second. Okay. So I'm going to lie to you, and I'm going to tell you it maintains a perfectly fixed orientation. It never changes, okay? And, and as that circle goes around the sun, 
we see the sun projected against a small subset of the 88 constellations. For instance, in March, when Earth is here, the sun appears projected against the constellation of Pisces. And in June, when Earth is here, the sun's projected against the constellation Gemini and so forth and so on. September, the sun's in Virgo, and then it's in Sagittarius or sometimes Ophiuchus now uh, in December. So these constellations are special to astrologers. They only care about those because those are the constellations through which the sun travels. And the idea is that the sun is like your energy god. The sun is Ra. And if the sun travels through these 12 constellations, well, then they must be special. And you know who else is special? You. You're special. You're a special person. And that's where we get down to the premise of astrology so that you guys understand what it is you're worshiping when you pay for your CoStar app, okay? So the central premise of astrology goes something like this. The location of the sun against the background stars and here's the real thing that tips you off to what's going on on your B day, on your birthday, is going to determine, determines your personality type and or your destiny. So this is the concept behind your sign, Capricorn, Sagittarius. This is what the people call your sun sign. Of course, even the most casual observer of human existence will quickly realize that there are more than 12 personality types out there in the world. So not to be confounded by observation, they'll quickly include, no, all right, we can't just have our sun sign. We also need the moon and the planets. And then, you know, Venus. You got Mercury, you got Pl your Pluto. You got a bunch of stuff on your birth chart. Oh yeah, yeah, you gotta, gotta scramble it up a little bit like any good game design. Um, the trouble with a, a premise, astrology's premise, like, what is astrology? Don't tell me what I can believe, bro. Don't oppress me. Well, I'll tell you something fine. You know, you can worship whatever totem pole you want, but then there are things like, you know, just observation and, and I don't want to say fact, but I want to say <laughs> support, supporting evidence. When you have a premise like this, the thing to realize is that this premise is grounded in objects that are in your physical universe that are capable of being observed. The sun, the moon, and the planets are all astronomical bodies that we can observe with our naked eyes, we can observe them with telescopes, and today we even have spacecraft like the Parker Solar Probe, which are en route to, to pass through the atmosphere of the sun actually touching the sun and collecting plasma particles from its atmosphere. So we not only observe these objects, we travel to the sun, moon, and planets, and we, we, we sample their physical bodies. Um, the background stars are capable of being observed through a telescope. Your birthday is a matter of historical record. Okay, so personality types are a little weird. You know, there is a noble, <clears throat> science of psychology, which attempts to measure personality types and put people into categories. You're an alpha dog, you're a beta fish, whatever it is, okay? And, and so we have to give them credit for trying. It's a difficult job, but people are trying to understand some basics about human personality. Your destiny is somewhat straightforward. You can just wait till you die and then you can you know take a look at what you did, see if any of it was cool. Um, it turns out that if you go and you measure 
the position of the sun against the background stars, you compare it to a person's birthday, and then you you try to match it up to their personality type or to their destiny or their the, their deeds of valor. It turns out that there is no relationship between a person's personality insofar as you can measure it and their birthday or the position of the sun. And if you do this with a sample size that's even reasonably large, like a hundred or a few hundred people, you quickly discover that this statement, this premise is an objectively verifiable false statement. Let's write that down. This is a false statement. And because astrology is based on statements that are objectively verifiably false, it is not considered a science because science has to back up its statements with observations. It is also not considered a religion because religions are concerned with the metaphysical world Things like, where does your soul go when you die? That's not stuff you can observe with a telescope. And therefore, philosophers have dubbed astrology as a pseudoscience. That's how we classify it. A pseudoscience is something that uses the technical jargon to make it sound like it's sort of a science but actually doesn't back up any of its statements uh, through verifiable observations. And basically it's, it's, it's snake oil. And that's not good. That's not a, that's not a thing that I want to, to believe in. I don't know about you guys, but that's, that's my personal preference. On the other hand, there's, there's, there's other kinds of stuff to spend your time thinking about like this. What the hell is this? This, my friends, is the real universe. This is a famous nebula called the Horsehead Nebula. And uh, there's a little seahorsey shaped cloud of hydrogen gas. Most of the universe, most of reality is actually pretty weird and abstract. Space is full of cold, icy clouds of hydrogen gas and giant radiating spheres of plasma. Our own world is something of an anomaly. We're the weirdos, all right? All of this stuff, that's normal. And that gets me thinking, what is all this stuff? What's going out there in the universe? Maybe we should find out all about that. That sounds interesting to me. That sounds like something I'd like to think about. And that's what we do when we study astronomy. So I don't know what you guys are gonna learn this semester, but I want you to start off with this one very important lesson. Astronomy is not the same thing as astrology. And with that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to our course, Astronomy 1010. This particular course deals with a subset of astronomy concerning itself with the solar system. So this is a sort of like a thinly veiled planetary science class. We're going to learn all about the objects of our solar system. And that's great because, well, there's a lot of cool stuff to see. And we've got some wonderful pictures of our solar system. I will be your host, Professor Brendan Britton. And I've been doing this for almost a decade now. Here's an action shot of me in front of our 16-inch telescope. Now, this is actually at the observatory uh, on the Warwick campus, the Margaret Jacoby Observatory. And at some point, uh, once we get back in person, I'd like to invite you all to come and take a peek through this thing and check out some stars and, and planets and nebulae. You'll probably really enjoy that. Uh, one of my former students, Josh, who took my other solar, uh, my stellar system class, he last semester, he was out here looking through this thing, right, Josh? Yep, it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, what did we see? We saw the Orion Nebula, we, we saw, saw some- yeah, the Ring Nebula, um, uh, the uh, binary star, uh, Alberio. Alberio, yeah, and um, I forget what else we saw. The uh, we saw the Moon, we saw Jupiter and Saturn, we saw a lot of stuff. Your class got a hell of a cosmic peep show, if you ask me. Okay, <laughs> man, right, that'll anyways, sure beat my dinky little telescope I got in my room. 
Well, if you want to bring that along, we can sort of see see what's up with that too. I mean, uh, a lot of telescopes that people have uh, in their house are sort of, well, we'll learn about telescopes with time. These long skinny ones are called refractors and they're actually, it's actually more difficult to point this at an object than you might think. But we can learn about how those work. At some point, we're gonna learn how to build one of those actually. Okay, enough about me. Uh, who are you? Well, I know Lionel and I know Josh, but the rest of you are new to me, okay? Whoever you are, I hope you show up to our lectures every Monday and Wednesday with the following two things. The first and the most important thing to have for this course is a calculator. And I'm gonna tell you exactly which model I want you to buy. The second is a positive attitude because you signed up for this. You decided to pay $500 to listen to me talk about seahorsey shaped clouds of hydrogen gas. And I thank you for your patronage, okay? I will be here with a good attitude talking about my favorite subjects, which are stars and planets and nebulae and things. Um, it's up to you to try to have a good time with this course if you can. Um, all classes are a bit of a slog, but I've done my best and I will do my best to make this as fun as possible and as painless as possible. But you will have to sort of trust me um, when, I, when I advise you, I know how to make this class go smooth if you can if you can just have a little faith okay okay um we're gonna learn about the solar system and that's awesome because the solar system is a cool place to be we're gonna learn about earth that's where you live actually one of the big takeaways from this class is that earth is a surprisingly interesting planet with lots of diverse geology and there's a reason why living organisms are here and hell we've even terraformed our planet to be even better for life. We've had more of an impact on our planet than you might think, and we're continuing to in a dangerous way. Um, you're also gonna learn about the moon. The moon is beautiful, everyone loves the moon, and the moon is an interesting object. The moon's an unusually large moon for an inner sort of solar system planet. So how'd that come to be? We'll study the sun. The sun is our star, and it's a vital and dynamic part of the solar system. The sun influences the evolution of planets, and it's also just freaking cool to look at. Let's face it, Praise right? the sun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and we'll eventually get around to talking about the eight planets, no longer featuring Pluto. Why isn't Pluto a planet anymore, friends? Why'd we do that? It's a dwarf planet. All right, what? so someone mentions it's a dwarf planet. Keep going. Tell me what you know. Um, I know they used to classify it as like a planet before, and then they're like, you yeah, know, not really, because does it have something to do with um, uh, um, I forgot the characteristics of it. I think it's something to do with uh, um, I know it's the size that they were talking well, about. Hold on, Josh. We always knew that Pluto was small. Um, yeah. One of the one of the difficulties uh, about <clears throat> observing things at the edge of the solar system. Oh, Mateo, I just saw that you raised a hand. Um, you'll never you'll never get anywhere playing by the rules in this class, buddy. You just you want to shout out if you've got a question. What do you say, Mateo? Oh no, I was just gonna say um, I read somewhere that Pluto. Uh, I'm sorry. The what is it called? The international. Yeah, International Astronomical yeah. Union. The yeah. IAU is like the body of all astronomy professors on Earth, and they get together and decide things. Yeah, like, didn't they um, like redefine the um, it's like how a planet is formed, or like or what or is, how a planet? Like, a better they, way to they say that is how a planet, planet is, is defined. Then, how a planet is defined. Yeah, and then Pluto didn't fit that definition anymore, so that's why they dropped it. Mateo, that is 100% correct. And let's help understand, Mateo, why that happened. Unlike the sun, which generates its own light, planets shine by reflected light. The sun bounces off the surface of the planet and the light bounces back towards you. But that means as you get farther and farther away from the sun towards the outer edge of the solar system, objects only reflect a tiny weak trickle of light back to you and that means they're really hard to see out there now pluto was one of the last planets discovered and we used to believe that pluto was the last planet in our solar system and then after that was kind of the inky void of space until you get to the next star 
But as people developed more powerful telescopes in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, and they, they began spending more time peering out into the darkness, they started finding other things besides Pluto. And those other things had very similar compositions to Pluto. And here's a little uh, smattering of them here. Um, we today call them Kuiper Belt objects. It's one of the regions at the edge of our solar system where, where comets come from. And there are things like Sedna and Quaywar. And this guy is now called uh, Hayumea, I believe. Uh, you know, who could forget 2003 UB313? Okay, so what happened is as we discovered more of these objects, people were getting concerned that there were a bunch of icy, rocky objects that were very similar in composition to Pluto. And if we were finding one, two, three, four, ten that easy, well, what happens when we, how many could there be out there? Someone estimated there could be up to 100,000 or maybe even a million of these Plutinos or whatever you want to call them, right? Sooner or later, we were going to find one that was bigger than Pluto. And when we did, well, the first guy who discovered it tried to call it Xena because he liked the TV show Xena Warrior Princess, and he thought that would be a cool name for a planet. And the International Astronomical Union said, oh, hell no, we ain't let you do that. So they've, they've since renamed it Eris, okay? But what were we supposed to do with Eris? It was bigger than Pluto. And it was probably not the last time we're going to find one. Well, are you going to make Eris a planet? If not, that's kind of weird. But if Eris is a planet and Pluto is a planet, what about all these other Kuiper Belt objects? Suddenly we had the equivalent of an immigration problem in our solar system. You can't let all the little Plutinos into, into you know, the solar system, what we have to do is say, okay, maybe we should have redefined what we meant by a planet, right? Maybe we should have said, if you're gonna be a planet, you gotta be this thing that has enough gravitational influence to sweep out the debris and sort of claim the, the track for yourself. And, you know, Pluto doesn't do that because there's a lot of objects out there, but just because Pluto is a planet doesn't mean it's not cool or beautiful or worthy of our study. We have now uh, elevated or demoted Pluto, but elevated some of those other objects to, to the status of a dwarf planet. And there are many dwarf planets in our solar system now, but probably some of the uh, more famous ones, which you'll eventually learn about. Uh, I don't have them in that picture, but I think I have them here. Function F54. Um, Pluto and Eris are now considered dwarf planets. There are a few others. I don't know if Hayumea or Make Make, which ones made it. But there's also a really cool one called Ceres, which is a large object in the asteroid belt. It's kind of like the king of the asteroids. You know, um, if you're a fan of the sci-fi show The Expanse, like I am, you know, being a sci-fi nerd kind of comes with the job here. Uh, but they, they have a, a murder mystery spread throughout the solar system and they travel to many of the objects we'll learn about in this class. Ceres is one of them. It's sort of a, a, a dwarf planet in this asteroid belt. Point being, we get a lot to learn about planets. And that's what the purpose of this course is all about. Now, if you want to learn about the solar system, and I know you do, um, you all going to need to make a new best friend, and your new best friend is math. And that's because this is a physical science class. And physical science classes like astronomy or physics, they involve measurement. That's what makes science fundamentally different than other subjects like art or music or accounting. Well, actually, accountants measure dollars and cents. We measure the masses of planets and their distances and the age of the solar system. Those are the measurements that we're interested in because we are interested in nature. That's why we do math. When you look at the moon and you think, wow, that's so beautiful. I love all this. What is that stuff anyways? Why are there so many little doodahs and hoo-hahs all over the moon? Well, if you want to enjoy and appreciate a picture like this, you need to learn to enjoy and appreciate pictures like this so you can understand how the moon formed and how it's evolved over time. If you are inspired when you look at Jupiter, and oops, it's great red spot. If you want to know that the great red spot, for instance, 
is a giant storm system twice the diameter of Earth. That is a cool factoid that you could not know without the use of some math, some geometry, okay? And that's why y'all gonna need to get one of these. This is the official calculator of Astronomy 1010. It is the Casio FX260 Solar, available wherever calculators are found. Now I bring mine to class every day and I need you to get this as soon as possible. Did anyone in my television audience actually get this already? I, I know I sent out the email really late and I apologize for that, but did anyone actually get one of these? Mine is yes. coming in tomorrow. I got mine. Killer. Well, I'm, I'm proud of you. Um, those of you who don't have this, you need to, you need to get it really fast because I'm going to be training you to use this. I'm going to actually start training you today. So I'm, I know a lot of you won't have that. That means you're going to miss out on the training in a way you're going to be behind. So I need you to get this, uh, very fast. Okay. Um, we're going to talk now, uh, well, this is probably the only thing that you really need for this course is the Casio FX 260 solar. There's a version in white. I don't have that here with me. And there's a specific one because I have a graphic calculator. I don't know. Okay, so we got to talk about that. Um, most of you do not know. Oh, hey, Marissa, I like your kitty. I love it when people share their animals. I've I got a kitty here that I can share. What's uh, what's your kitty's name, Marissa? Let's just talk about that for a second. Her name's Nala, and she has separation issues, so she'll most likely be in most of the classes. I I approve of that. We want we want to see your your cat. That's one of the fun things about pandemic learning. Thank you, Jordan. Here, here's here's our kitty. This is this is Phil. Phil, say hi to the class. He's a twenty five pound man coon. He's a big fatty. How are you doing? Ah, uh, you all have your cats with you too. You like astronomy? Phil? I love him. <laughs> He's a little lion. Wow. I have no idea where my cats are. <laughs> I also do not have access to a camo to show you. Oh, no. Ethan, we got to see if CCI can support you on. It's fun. Uh, there was this one guy who lived on a farm last year, and he would have like roosters and chickens in his lap during class. And I loved that. It really, <laughs> really makes for some good background videos. So feel free to bring your, your little creepy crawlers. Uh, you know, we'll take a look at your terrarium. We're down for whatever here. We're interested in nature. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, let's take a moment before we get into too much more astronomy stuff. And we want to learn kind of like how the classroom works, how your grades determines. There's a whole bunch of garbly gook that we got to go over so that you know what I expect of you. Like for instance, in most classes, getting a book and other things like that are very important. And there is a book for this course, and it might help you if you're going to read it. But to be honest, you could probably muscle your way through this course with nothing except the Casio FX260 Solar. And it only costs about like eight bucks. Um, I think it might be 15 at the CCRI bookstore. You can get it at Walmart. You can get it at Staples. If you guys are out in Warwick or Providence or somewhere, just go to your nearest Staples or Walmart and just buy the damn thing. Like today, please. Um, Let's talk about the person who's got a graph and calculator or something. You know, I, I am part of the Brotherhood of Nerd. I've got my own TI-85. But even if you, let's say you know how to use this thing. Let's say you're, you know, Jimmy Calculus and you, you did you know, vector calculus, you know how to do this stuff. The first question I would ask you is this. Do you know where your fourth root key is on your calculator? That's a good test. If you don't know what the hell I'm talking about, you absolutely need to buy the Casio. But there's another reason why you need to get the Casio anyways, which is I wanna give one set of instructions for all the students in my class. And you guys don't realize it, but there's three sections of your class. There's three sections of my other astronomy class. I've got like over a hundred students. If I have to give boutique instructions, most of you don't know how to do math and that's okay. That's why you're here. I am gonna assume that you are a reasonable person with a good attitude about life, that you can buy an $8 calculator and that you can push the key that I tell you to push when I say go, and I'm gonna teach you how to math, okay? But I can only do that if I have one set of instructions for everyone. Even if you are an engineering or a science student, and I, I love it when you guys, when the science and engineering students take my class, because I think 
that I have something to offer them as well, not just non-science people. This calculator is actually really awesome for so many reasons. Um, it's small, light, portable. It's powered by the sun, which I think is appropriate for an astronomy class. The batteries will never die on you, okay? And it has the keys that you wanna use every day in an easy and convenient to locate spot. This is the equivalent of like a Stinger missile, right? And, and this is the equivalent of like a six shooter, right? And, and sometimes when you wanna shoot a cowboy, you don't wanna shoot the cowboy with a Stinger missile. It's just too much. It's, it's faster to pull out your, your quick draw and pew, 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 you know, shoot him away. So I, I think that even science students who I've had learned to love this calculator and appreciate why it's so great. Um, it's eight bucks. That's probably one of the cheapest things that you have to buy for your education. And maybe the most important, I would actually argue. I think this is the most important thing. So please, if you even if you have a TI-85 or some other weird calculator, could you please just get the Casio anyways? It's actually gonna make things better for you because then you won't get bogged down in 20 different instructions and the class will just be smooth, okay? I, I've been doing this for 10 years. I know what works and I know it doesn't. You're gonna have to trust me. Get the damn Casio, get it today, please. Okay, uh, enough of that. Let's talk about other parts of the course. Um, the first thing that I wanna do is take y'all over to uh, the Blackboard for the class. Um, I'm assuming that you guys know how this works, but maybe some of you are new to college or maybe you're new to the remote learning. Someone told me the other day that that was their first Zoom class. Um, so I'm logging in here to my Blackboard and um, this live course is gonna be a mixture of Astronomy 1010 Section 1, Section 2, and I've invited the night students, even though they probably can't come, to come and sit on the live lecture. Night students, you probably can't sit in the live lecture because you're working, but you'll watch the video that I'll post shortly after the class ends. And by the way, I just want to make sure I'm still recording. Okay, good. Um, uh, by the way, whenever you write me an email, don't say, hey, I'm in your astronomy class. That's annoying. I have six sections. I have a hundred students. I don't know what astronomy class you're in. And the answer that you want from me often depends upon what section you're in. So say, hi, I am William Russell. I am in astronomy 1010 section 001. That's how we talk to each other, okay? That would be really great to help me help you. Um, but anyways, let's just go into section 001, which some of you should be in. Um, uh, I'm gonna post the videos for each class here in the announcements section. And I did something, I left the videos from my previous semester. I don't know if it was winter semester or what it was, but it's a mixture of different videos. So kind of like the whole class is already here, but I'm trying to give you guys the live experience as I was you know, uh, asked to do. And I think that's fair. Um, I'm gonna post the video of each class here in the announcements, but if for some reason you ever needed to jump ahead because you were going on a vacation or something, you, you could try to find the appropriate video. Warning, I do kind of tweak and vary things from semester to semester. Some semesters have a little more time, some have a little less. So you might see me changing, the, like mixing two chapters together or something. So just be wary of that. But for the most part, you can figure out what's going on down here. Um, but we'll try to focus on the new videos that we make for spring 2022. Let's all click on syllabus and schedule. I asked you to do that. These are the two most important documents I'm gonna be giving you. Um, the syllabus is really helpful because it tells you about the times of our lecture in our lab and the all important office hours. Currently they're all on Zoom, but I guess after February 14th-ish or something, we should be going back to in-person classes. We're gonna to have to make an adjustment in our methods when we do that, but maybe we'll deal with that later. Here's my email. Here's my freaking cell phone number. Call me up, text me anytime, day or night. I don't care. I field questions from people all day long, all night long. You know, you can text me whatever you want. You just might have to deal with whatever state of inebriation or stupidity I'm in, but I will always try to answer you and, and, and help if I can. Occasionally people slip through the cracks because I like see it with one crusty eye when I'm waking up at four, I don't know. So you might wanna have to ping me a couple of times if you, if you don't hear from me. I, Usually I try to get back to people right away, but you can easily be in a supermarket and get a text and then you just, 
you know, so I'm trying to have, I'm trying to let you guys have access to me since we're over the Zoom thing. Uh, we're going to meet for lecture Mondays and Wednesdays, 1130 to 1. Um, the way this is supposed to work is Monday is when I do lab for section 001, and Wednesday is when I do lab for section 002. Um, but there's something else that we need to work about on about. Um, your, your grade for this course is a mixture of four different things. 25% um, of your grade comes from doing labs because this is a lab science course. Since it's a four credit course, I figured if one credit is for lab, then 25% of your grade is for lab. 25% um, of your grade comes from our homework assignments, which we will be doing one lab per week and one homework per week. And then all of your other points, I don't know why that says 50%, that's supposed to say 25%, apologies. Uh, the rest of your points come from uh, midterm and final. In fact, I should remember to edit this and, and, and put that back up there. Okay, so uh, the labs and the homeworks are really important. Um, let's take a look at the other document that I gave you. This is our class schedule, and this is actually the most, hold on a second here. Uh, are you guys still looking at my screen? Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, yes, I am. Excellent, okay. This is the schedule. This is the document that really matters because it's sort of like the roadmap for what we're gonna do. Uh, a note to nighttime students, I'm trying to have all of the students have the exact same astronomy 1010 schedule this semester to see if I can do that. I think that will really help with confusion and it will also allow students maximum flexibility to kind of sift between their courses. So we didn't have class on Monday. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Uh, but uh, it, it's sort of scheduled to be like each week we do a chapter and each week we do a lab, and each week we do a homework. The homeworks consist of five problems from the end of chapter problems in the textbook. And this might be a good time for us to talk about the textbook. I obviously wasn't anticipating teaching from home this semester, so I don't have the most modern version. The modern version, the ninth edition, is at my office. That's what you would need. I have an older edition. The official book for this course is The Cosmic Perspective, and they kind of divided the book into two halves. One half is the solar system, that's the class that you're in, and one half is stars, galaxies, and cosmology, that's the class that Lionel is in as well. You can buy the whole textbook as a physical item, you can buy it as a three ring binder or as an ebook, or you can rent it on Amazon. Uh, most of you who are just taking one course will just want to get, in your case, you guys would want to get the solar system version. This is the seventh edition. That's not the edition that you want. You want the ninth edition. So the cover is some other different astral picture, okay? Um, I have the, the, my lectures sort of follow these chapters. And when we do our homework, I want you guys to check this out here, what I've done for you. For our labs and for our homeworks, I've tried to provide you with the documents you need to get the work done. So for instance, our first homework, which we're gonna be doing this week, is five problems from the end of chapter two. And if you right click this PDF, I've actually provided the page showing you the homework problems. So our first homework problem is uh, chapter two, number 44, new planet. A planet in another solar system has a circular orbit and an axis tilt of 35 degrees. Would you expect this planet to have seasons? If so, would you expect them to become more extreme? If not, why not? This is an example of an essay type question where you read the question and then you sort of write a little paragraph about it. Some of the questions are going to be mathematical questions like this difficult one, which I have assigned. Eclipse conditions. You're gonna calculate the angular size of the sun and moon at perigee and apogee. What the hell am I talking about? Great question. It's my job to train you on this stuff during the course of lectures. The reality is, is that these questions are gonna be probably too difficult for you, even if you do diligently attend the lectures and, and, and do notes, 
they're just too tough your first time around. And that's why I decided the best way to do this is for us to all do the homework together. Now, you can consider this optional if you want, but only it would be suicidal to not take me up on this. Rather than you doing the homework on your own and doing it badly and being frustrated and taking hours and hours and hours for a mediocre grade, you can do it with me as fast as possible, usually in one and a half hours, and then your homework is done. It's done perfect. Your grade goes up and you don't have to worry about it. In other words, I'm offering to do your homework for you if anyone's interested in that, okay? But that means we gotta hang out a little bit extra, okay? I think it's worth it. Most other students do as well. So those are my office hours. And uh, what we're gonna do now, the pandemic actually works in our advantage in that sense. Here's how we're gonna do this, guys. Uh, where's the bloody uh, schedule again? Okay, so what we're gonna be doing is on Mondays, we will have the first half of the lecture, which this week is on the night sky, chapter two. We have an hour and a half of lecture, and then on Mondays, everyone is gonna do the lab. And the labs we do together, I'll have some stuff set up here, and you follow along with me, you copy down everything I do and you submit it, 10 points for you, check. And then on Wednesdays, we will have the second half of the lecture, another one and a half hours. And then afterwards, we will all do our homework together. That's pretty awesome because that means every Monday and Wednesday, it's hour and a half of lecture and then one hour afterwards of either doing lab or doing homework. Lab Mondays, homework Wednesdays, okay? Then all of your astral work is done. You don't have to take anything else home with you. You're already home, I guess, but all right. This is gonna suck a little more when we go back in person because there's two sections in this course. So what I did last semester, in previous semesters, I had tutors to help. So I would have section 001 in lab, which I would run, and then I'd have my tutors help with the homework for the 002 people. But then they like dried up all the funding for the tutors. So what I did last semester, and it kind of sucked, is we did lecture. And then on Mondays, section 001 did lab. And then we did our homework. And then I did a whole thing all over again on Wednesdays. Section 002 did lab. And then 002 did homework. We're probably going to go back to something like that once we go back. But for now, things are cool because we'll be really efficient. Does everyone understand the plan and the program? Do you understand how this helps you? Because it means all of your labs get done and all of your homeworks get done and they get done perfect. And that means even if you take the test and do a wicked bad job, you will still pass this class with a C or better as long as you do all the labs and all the homeworks. Basically, you just hang out with me and you pass the course. I couldn't think of a better way to do things, right? Hey, Lionel, what's that Poosh's name? I like that guy. Look at that guy. <laughs> uh, that's Jacob. He's a little psychopath. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. We want to see him tearing your place apart. Okay. <laughs> yeah. He tore my door down. The little uh, Christmas paper I had on him. Yeah, that cat fell when it's hungry. It, it chews the, whatever wires it finds. Last year, it chewed the fucking webcam thing excuse me it chewed my webcam wire so if one day I, i'm ever not present it's because phil ate some valuable wire i can't chew through my uh mouse wire oh man That's one of these days i wanted to get into some 220 and teach him a lesson you know <laughs> <laughs> okay um <clears throat> all right cool so uh you know luckily guys i'm not your art teacher okay i don't have to make up your grade look at your crappy little sculpture at the edge of the semester and say, oh, B minus, you know, your grade is a numerical system that you need to put points into. And I will help you do that, right? So you don't really get any points for coming to lecture because that's because you paid to learn stuff. But you get 10 points each week for your labs, 25 points each week for your homeworks. And when I add up all your 12 labs, that's your 25% of your lab grade. Uh, when I add up all your homeworks, that's 25% of your grade. The other 25% comes from a midterm and a final. And those are gonna be on key dates. Um, I've been toying with the idea of doing something different this semester. Normally the night class has one midterm and one final, and they're each big scary tests, which are a hundred points long. 
Historically, I couldn't do that for the day class because they only meet for one and a half hours. So I would give the day class two mini midterms each 50 points, which is kind of okay, but it's kind of also awful because that just means more tests. And I would like to have less tests and less stress. So I'm thinking of trying to figure out a way to work with you guys to do one big midterm and one big final, just like the night class does. In other words, I wanna get every single Astro student on the same page doing the same thing. Um, it may mean that we have to either spend a little extra time with your midterm, or it might mean that we have to divide it into two sections that week. But right now, the target date I have for the midterm, if you look at the schedule, is just before spring break, just before midterm grades are due, like Monday, February 28th. So that's a day where we should be back in person. And I, I really need you to be there and take that test on that day, okay? Um, I've designed a curve for this course. If you do every lab and every homework with me, you will automatically pass with a C or better, no matter how crappy you do. You have to show up to the final and fill in the bubbles, or you have to, you know, you can't just get a zero on your midterm and final, but you can get pretty close to it and still get a C, all right? So all you gotta really focus on is doing the homeworks and labs with me. And that's why I make a big deal about it. You see that? Okay. I think I've cooked this book so that uh, we can have a great semester. We can hang out, we can talk about cool shit. We'll do the labs together, we'll do the homeworks together. I think low stress is a better way to learn than high stress. That's my philosophy. I do need to impose upon this entire course and ask them in return for a small favor this week, which is actually a favor to you, but hear me out, okay? You know how like, you know how we missed Monday, but we're having class on Wednesday? Well, that's going to really screw things up because that's the only missed, like there's spring break, but that takes out a whole week. This is the only missing Monday. And what that means is we're supposed to have one more lecture at the very end on Monday, May 2. And that just makes things really janky because I want to do part one of the lecture on Monday with the lab, part two of the lecture on Wednesday with the homework. And if we follow that rhythm, things will like run really smooth and then we don't have to have that final Monday class. So what I'm gonna ask of you guys, and I, I'm only talking to the people who can interface with me now, but you're making the decision to everyone. Would it be okay for me to ask you just this once to watch the pre-recorded video for the second half of this lecture where we do lecture and then homework? And I want you to do it this week. So today we're gonna have lecture one, part one, and we're about to do lab at one o'clock. I'm probably using up a lot of time here. At one o'clock today, we'll do our lab in a half an hour, right? But then I'm gonna leave it up to you. I'll show you where the link is. Let me share screen. And although it pains me to impose like this, it's so good for the class. If you guys in the announcements section here, so this is the class that, excuse me, I'm waiting for Blackboard to, So basically this, it's gonna load in a second here. Blackboard's being stupid. This is the lecture that we just had, lecture zero. And we're about to spend a half an hour doing part of lecture one. And we're gonna do lab one together. Sorry, this is being weird. This is the video right here. I don't know why I called it lecture two, but it's, it's lecture one, part two. No wonder this is all weird. I basically need you to watch this video and let me do the homework with you sort of pre-recorded and you get that in by Sunday night or Sunday day at noon. Is that something you think you can do? Watch one more lecture, say tomorrow or Friday or Saturday and do that homework for me. That's the only time I'll impose upon you like that. Is that cool? I got you, I got you. I'll do it. All right, that's so, and let me explain why. This means, by the way, at the end of the semester, when you're all like jet lagged and, and just whacked from a whole semester, you're gonna be so grateful that we don't have to do that last Monday. That will give you a Monday before exams start and you're gonna want that time, trust me on this. And it also means that like all of my labs will be synchronized. So like, think about it. I've got, to, guess where my lab room is? It's over there for the next you know month or so, right? That means all of my labs will all be synchronized. So I set up one thing per week. 
You see what I mean? This is like such a good thing to do. And honestly, it's kind of the same thing for you guys. It's not the same as interfacing live, but you'll just watch the video and you'll do the homework. So you'll have a lab and a homework done for this week. All right. So is that something we can all, does anyone have any strong objections or some reason why that's too much of an ask for them? I just have one, one question. Yep. Um, you're saying that we have a lab at one today. I have a different class at one, but I'm scheduled for labs on Mondays. Right. So obviously some of you are going to be in that situation because you signed up having the computer make your schedule or whatever. And some of you, you're probably, you guys, Ethan and Marissa, you're probably in section 002, right? Right. I think so. Oh, you're in. Yeah, I have the same. Yeah, I'm in section zero zero two as well. Okay, hold on, Marissa. If you're in section zero zero one, you should be able to come to lab on Monday. Oh, sorry, today is Wednesday, right? Sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, I, I'm. On, I keep thinking today is Monday because it's the first class, right? That's why we got to fix this problem right freaking now. Okay. Um. Yes, some of you will have a class at one, and here's what you're gonna do. I'm recording these videos. Go to your class. Do your thing. And then you will come back. I, I usually post the videos from this day sometime between 4 and 5 p.m. It takes about two hours to render the video and upload it to YouTube. And then you will watch it later and do the homework by yourself. Understood? That's actually one of the cool things about the pandemic and about the recording of stuff is you guys can still get that same benefit of doing the homework with everyone. It is sad that you won't be able to be here and interface with me live, but at least you'll be able to get the work done proper like everyone else. Do, do you see what I mean, guys? So I understand that some of you will have to bounce out at one o'clock, either on a Monday or on a Wednesday. And if so, that's fine. Just promise me you'll come back and watch the video later, do the work and upload it. It's just that easy. And by the way, you'll see if you have to leave today, at the end of lab today, I'm gonna show everyone how to like take a picture of their assignment, how to upload it. And I even kind of check and make sure that their assignment went through. So you'll kind of get a good idea of how I want you to submit things. Okay. Um, is it okay if I ask for a, um, when we go back into like in-person classes, is there any way that you're gonna be able to record the in-person classes for the people that have class at one? Right, so in that case, it should work out a little bit differently. The recordings, I've already recorded this class several times. So no matter what, Marissa, there will be a recording. But usually the way this works, and maybe let me go to uh, speaker view here. When we do this in person, here's the way I did it last semester with my uh, solar system class. Uh, Marissa, are you in section 001 or 002? 001. So what I did with, with, with those classes, so here's Monday and here's Wednesday. And everybody does the uh, 1130 to 1 p.m. That's the lecture, right? And then afterwards, on Mondays is lab for 001. On Wednesdays is lab for 002. And that's because there's limited lab space. So it only holds about 12 to 14 people. What I would do then is I figured, what's the best time for Monday people to do their homework in person? They're already at CCRI. They're already with me, this lab. And lab is supposed to be honest. Lab is supposed to go from 1 to 3 p.m. So I know you've got that free, right? I try to squeeze the lab in from like 1 to 2 p.m. And then immediately afterwards, I do the homework from like 2 to 3 p.m. Okay, sometimes it goes a little bit over, 3.15 or 3.30. If that screws up for you, you can always watch the pre-recorded video. One of the good things about doing the homeworks in the labs together live in person is peer pressure just kind of forces you to stay there and do it. And that way you don't fuck up, right? The number one way to fuck this up is by being a flake. And sometimes you need a group psychology to keep you from flaking. Um, so same thing with this here. So what I'm hoping, uh, Marissa, is that, although right now I don't see a need to go that long because we can all do lab together virtually and then we can all do homework here. That, that's the most efficient for us, right? But once we're back in person, I will revert to this, this technique. And then hopefully you can be there for some or all of it. Regardless, I will always have a video. Hell, if you guys like the video better, 
I can go take a nap, I can drink a pina colada, and you can watch all the pre-recorded videos. Presumably, we decided that we like a little bit of human interaction. That's why we're doing it this way, right? The videos are there for you if you need them. Okay. So I hope I'm trying to you know, answer every question. Does that sound good? Anyone want to ask anything else before we proceed? Yeah, Just, where, uh, where sure. do we, Ethan? Where, yeah, where do we hand in the um, homeworks? Sure, great question. So um, uh, you'll notice here on the side of the thing, it, there's a tab for lab and there's a tab for homework. And in fact, today's lab is on scientific notation. I have to do a module on that before we get to the lab. Um, I even have the lab worksheet for you here. We do not always do all of the pages. You only have to do the ones that we do today. And I think to be honest, we're only gonna have time to do the first page today because I go off roading. Um, the best way to do it is to print this page. So I'm gonna actually print mine out. I don't know print all pages. I'm just gonna print uh, the first page. And I'm gonna hit print now. And then we can work on that worksheet by hand. And then at the end, we'll take a photo of it and turn it in. Now, what if you don't have a printer? You've got two options. One option is you can actually try to write by hand in your notebook all the problems and then do them and take a photo and submit it. That's great. Um, if you're going to try typing, I have a real strong objection or people who die who really love to type. You are not allowed to do math like this. You are not allowed to type if you don't know what an equation editor is. I do not want to see this kind of bullshit uh, in your homeworks. That's going to drive me freaking crazy. You, you can't grade math like that. Anyone who desires to type must be a competent person who knows to how to use the equation editor. And you have to make the math on your homework look like the math that we write onto the board, right? You have to use these symbols. Where's your equation editor here? Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm screwing all this up. You've got to be like one astronomical unit is equal to 150. And then where, where's the damned thing here? Yeah, 150, you have to use times, come on, times. You got to see this is a little bit annoying fraction stuff you have to do 150 times 10. This is what your math needs to look like, just like it does when I write it on the board. If you can't handle this kind of a thing, if you can't make math look good with an equation editor, you cannot handle typing and you should just write by hand and take a photo. Now, I wanted to say that once so that I, everyone knew that. The real answer to uh, his question is when it's time to submit, the easiest way is you click on this lab one powers of 10 and I'll walk you through it at the end of lab today. I'll make sure everyone gets theirs in. Okay. You take a, don't write the submission, never choose that option. Take a photograph of the work that you did by hand, browse local files and upload the photograph. Hopefully you can try to make sure it's not rotated sideways. Uh, uploading it from your computer is always better than doing it from your phone. Okay. Some of you have probably already learned that. Does that answer the question, Ethan? Same thing with the homework, by the way, uh, for homework, and that's where the labs are, right? But for homework, it's the same thing. You, we're going to do the homework together. You click on this, you take a photo of your homework, browse local files, you upload the picture. Okay. Got it. Marissa, what was your question? Um, sometimes it's kind of hard for me to follow along while someone's talking. Is there uh, the, the PowerPoint slides that you're going to do the lectures on? Does that basically line up with the chapter in the textbook that's assigned for that week? Yeah, pretty much. And you'll notice that I provided those PowerPoints. They might be a little bit out of date because I update them all the time. But you can get, uh, you just had lecture zero. Oh, by the way, uh, in addition to the PowerPoint slides, I also, if you want to follow along, have these crappy Roman numeral outlines. For instance, you guys just had, oh my God, this is my, Microsoft 97. Okay, well, we need to update those documents, but uh, uh, you just had lecture zero, an introduction to astronomy 1010. So this is kind of what we just did. It took a little bit longer than I wanted, but whatever, it always does. Um, and now we're gonna go into our next lecture. Here's lecture notes. Uh, now these are not all inclusive lecture notes, but they, they kind of help give you sense of the top-down structure, Marissa, of what we're doing. So now we're going to do a bit of lecture one, but really what we need to do right now is we have to do a module on scientific notation, okay? 
And then the PowerPoints, yes, they follow along with the chapters as well. Okay, let's do some stuff that we need for our lab today. Let's go over scientific notation. That is a key skill in this course, okay? The reason why we need to learn scientific notation is because the study of astronomy is the study of insanely massive and large things, right? So for instance, we're going to be learning about planets. We're going to be measuring their masses. Um, we're going to be studying the size of the solar system, kind of a big place. And um, if you left the solar system, you would find the solar system is, you know, the solar system is the sun and the planets and a few comets and asteroids. And then there's kind of empty space until you get to the next star, which is Alpha Centauri. But if you were to zoom out, we would find that our solar system is one of many stars that make up the Milky Way galaxy. And a galaxy is like a disk that is a collection of stars and planets, but it's also a lot of gas and dust as well. So galaxies are like swirls of gas and stars. That's how I think of it. As an example of the sort of numbers that we have to deal with, let's start by considering uh, the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so here's our first major lesson of the day. It's on scientific notation. Scientific notation is how we write big numbers. If you want to know what a big number is, a big number is bigger than 1 million. And as a meditation point, let us start by considering the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. That's not a number I'd expect you to know off the top of your head. Uh, it's one trillion stars, approximately. Do you guys know how big the number one trillion is? Do you know how many zeros are in one? I'm, I'm having some glare issues because it's getting sunny out. So hold on, let me see if I can fix that. How many stars are in, I'm sorry, how many, how many zeros are in a uh, trillion? Uh, oh. That's right. So let's write that down, guys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 stars. And you guys know the rule, right? We put commas after every three zeros. If you're weird and British, maybe you use periods. I don't know. But we use commas because we're Americans. All right. So this is tens, sorry, ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions. Take a look at your Casio calculator that you don't have yet, okay? If I take the Casio calculator, I can type into it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have 10 decimal places to work with, which means I cannot write down the number one trillion because there are 12 13 digits in the number 1 trillion. How do you put a number like this into your calculator? How do you write it on your paper? You use scientific notation. And scientific notation will make use of your powers of 10 that you may have learned about in some old math class, right? So let's review over here in blue. Uh, 10 to the power of 1 means 1 10. And there's, in algebra, there's always a secret one multiplied in the darkness there, okay? The secret darkness one that's always multiplied in the background. Okay, so 10 to the power of two means multiply two tenths. And that's 100, right? Uh, 10 to the power of three is when you multiply three tens. And that's 1,000. And after a while, you don't really need to do this step anymore. You start to recognize that when you raise 10 to some power, you get a one followed by that number of zeros. For instance, 10 to the power of four 
is 10,000. 10 to the power of five is 100,000. 10 to the power of six is a million. You guys try it. What is 10 to the power of zero? One. That's right. Zero. It's not zero. This is a trick. Zero is not the default number in algebra, okay? If you remove the 110, there is a one hidden in the darkness, okay? Any number raised to the power of zero is one because you're multiplying that number zero times, but it's one that's left over, not zero, okay? It's kind of, this is a rule that you learn first through brutality, and then later on it makes sense, all right? This is an important thing for scientific notation. Please uh, never forget, okay? Any number raised to the zero is one. We're gonna use powers of 10 to pack our number into a compact form. But first, a couple of definitions here. The first number in your number is called the lead digit. The lead digit cannot be zero. It has to be one through nine. But if you forget about zeros, the lead digit's the first number in your number for the most part. Then there's this part. This is the number of zeros. You could also call it the power of 10. Sorry, the, the red doesn't really translate to the screen very well. Here's an even better way uh, to, to put this. We refer to the number of zeros as the order of magnitude. That's a fancy expression for what power of 10 are you, okay? People use this term all the time and you're gonna hear me use it. Lastly, we have a tag called the unit. The unit tells you what it is you are measuring. Units are of extreme importance in our astronomy course and you will always write them down. Okay, the rest is easy. Pack the powers of 10, pack the number of zeros, into one of these powers of 10 here. So I write down my lead digit, multiply by 10 to the 12, because there are 12 zeros, and then I write down stars. That's how we write the number 1 trillion in our astronomy class. It's not a math problem, it's a number, one times 10 to the 12. To help us put this into our calculators, we have a very important key. The EXP is our scientific notation key. And EXP basically means times 10. So you will never type times 10 again, you will only use EXP. For instance, in my calculator, I would write this one EXP 12. Um, a note to people who are gonna be doing this with a different calculator today, because you haven't gotten your Casios. On other calculators like this TI-85, instead of a EXP key, they sometimes use a double E. Sorry, I know this isn't perfectly in focus here. They use a double E key instead of the EXP key. But for everyone using the Casio, we're just gonna use the EXP key down here. So I want you to watch how I do this here, okay? I'll see if I can get rid of the glint. Okay, I would just type, watch me do this, one EXP, 12. You'll notice that they don't put in the times 10 because there's sort of not enough room. So when you see this on your calculator, it's going to look like this. Uh, excuse me. It's going to look like a one to the, the 12, but you must, this is what you see, but this is not what you write. Okay. So this is what you write. This is what you type, and this is what you see. You must never write down one to the power of 12 without the times 10 on your paper. I will mark you wrong. Please remember, students, that if you raise one to the power of 12, that's like one times one times one times one 12 times. One to the power of 12 is one. So your calculator can kind of do this because it expects you to understand that this is scientific notation mode and that the times 10 is there. 
But when you write it back onto your paper, you're obligated to write the times 10 in. Does everyone understand that? Never, ever, ever, ever write that down. Part of the reason we're gonna be doing lab on this in a few moments is to train and to make sure that you're not screwing up like that, okay? The EXP key is your friend. Uh, before we end class and transition to lab, which we need to do soon, uh, uh, I wanna give you one more example, okay? Now listen, uh, I'm guessing some of you have had this before. Let's look at my gallery view. Oh my gosh, they're dropping like flies. I've only got three of you left. This is why I require a certain number of share views. How many of you have done scientific notation before this class? I wanna see what I'm working with here. Kind of a little bit. Michelle, have I you have. done it? I have. Okay. A little bit, but I forgot a long it. time ago. Last, like four years ago. Yeah, I was about to say, Michelle, you look familiar to me. Was that four years ago already? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it was really mad as I signed up. I have my old textbook, though. All right. You can, even though yours might not be the most modern one, you can muscle through with it. Wow. For, oh, wow. You even have the lab book. The lab book yeah. is now out of print. So I kind of use, rather than make you guys buy a lab book, I kind of like copy some of them, but I, I morph and modify them. So we kind of go off-roading a bit. You always want to do the lab with me. Never try to do the lab on your own. Okay. Same with homework. Well, well Michelle, it's great to... I got to head out. I got another class. Okay. But you're going to watch the video that I post later. You can jump to an hour and a half in, right? It'll be, yep. post, it'll be posted to the announcement section of YouTube. I'm oh, right. sorry. I'm oh, sorry. It'll be posted the, to the announcement the, section the, of yeah, Blackboard. The, the, I said that Blackboard. badly. I, I, no, don't worry. I know what you're talking about. Thank God. I already yeah. kind of took a look through it all. Awesome. So you will do lab one and turn that in today or tomorrow or something, right? Yes, sir. And then I can also count on you to watch the second part of the lecture and do the homework before Sunday, right? Uh, yes. Me remember we made that pact? We made that secret covenant? Oh, it's a blood pact. Okay. It's a blood pact. Okay, please All right. don't mess around, okay? Don't fuck this up. If you do this, then everything else is going to be smooth. All right? Okay. Yeah, Ethan. So for, for Sunday, watch the lecture that you're currently going to do while I leave. And then, not the lecture, the lab, right? Right. So in other words, uh, if this is Blackboard, in the announcement section... After today, you will see a post that says lecture 01, and it will have today's lecture in lab. It'll, it'll basically look like this, lecture one, part one, lab one, right? And then for the second video that I put, well, the second video that I post will be a repost of this video, lecture one, part two, homework one. Now, I don't know why it says lecture. In fact, let's just, let's fix this shit right now before this gets out of control. So sometimes I make little mistakes, you know. There we go. See that? That's what we're. So basically, if you're going to bounce before you do lab today, you need to scroll ahead to lab one, which starts an hour and a half in. You need to do that lab. You guys owe me lab one and homework one by Sunday at noon. Okay. Capiche? And we can, and we can learn how to do all that from these two videos. Oh, yeah. I'm going to walk you painstakingly slow through every little part. Okay. 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 Basically, and I can... you're just gonna you're just gonna copy whatever I write down, and you're gonna turn that in. You're not. I okay. don't have the right to think yet. You haven't earned that right. You follow okay. and you copy. You are my disciples until I get give you some wings. Okay. All right. Okay. The rest of us are gonna stick around to do lab live, right? That's the plan. Yeah. Thank you very much. You gotta you gotta go, Marissa, too. Uh, thank you. Okay. Wait. Is anybody going to do lab with me live? I am, but I don't have a camera. That's fine. Uh, but, you know, like, hey, you guys remember the deal, right? There's a bunch I'm of people back there. And I know some people don't have cameras, and that's no shame on your game, I guess. But I, I have good videos by I see you. I have good videos that are recorded for this. So I don't want to be doing this to an empty room. Or I don't want to do this to a room of black squares that aren't interfacing with me. Because then you can just oh, watch that's... a freaking video. God, you know what all right. My so, camera's broken anyway, so I'm not able to like do anything. I apologize for that. that <laughs> I, I know there's a lot of issues like that, and that's fine. Just do me the courtesy of if this if this is day one, I can only imagine what it's gonna be like day day 10, right? 
So if it starts getting to the point where no one's talking to me anymore, you guys are getting the pre-recorded lectures. I just want to warn you for that, okay? If it gets down to a part where I only talk or see one person, then you're getting the pre-recorded lectures and let me do something else with my time, okay? I'm happy to do this live, provided that I feel I need to get some live back, okay? All right. Nice. So, and I understand that people like Ethan and Cole and the other person who has a camera in his fucking keyboard. All right. So fine. Not everyone's got a laptop camera, but some of you do. All right. Um, I've used up my moments here. So I was going to give you one more example. I, I guess here. Here's the last example for people who don't need it. Whenever you have a number, a number that doesn't have zeros, this is my last lesson, okay? So here's one, two, three, four, point five, six, seven. If you wanna put a number that doesn't have zeros into scientific notation, first you find your lead digit and you write it down and you put a decimal point and then you keep all the rest of the numbers as change. And then you do a times 10 and your power is the number of times that you move the decimal place. In this case, three times. So that number is that number written as scientific notation. But write that down in your notes and then we can do that. You count the number of times you move the decimal point. That's your power. Sorry, it's a wee bit of glare there. Okay, um, we're about to take a transition to lab and here's what I propose. I am going to pause the recording so we don't have dead air. I am going to, during that pause, move the laptop over to my desk. That's where I usually do lab stuff because I've got a better surface to work with. Do you guys all, Jacob, welcome. Nice to see you alive, alert, awake, enthusiastic. You look like you just crawled out of bed, okay? All right, so <laughs> um, I printed just the first page of the lab. That's what we're gonna work on together for lab today. It's gonna be a nice, simple lab. Um, if you can't print this, then you should write this down into your notebooks, and that's what you'll take a picture of. Uh, I'm gonna pause for five minutes. Not only will I move the laptop over there where I do labs, but I will also get a delicious glass of iced tea and I will drink that iced tea. And then in five minutes or so, we will get going. Is that acceptable for everyone? Sometimes a brief, brief yeah. pause before we start lab is kind of like we were transit. Normally we'd leave the classroom and we'd go down to the lab room and you can like hit the bathroom or get a drink. This is, this is the psychic equivalent of that, okay? So I will pause, I'll be here, but I'm gonna get some iced tea and get all prepped and I'll see you guys with some, get any kind of calculator you can find, even if it's on your phone and I'll see you in five minutes or so. All right. I might be able to print it in five minutes. That's perfect, that's what I was hoping. Okay, Astronomy 1010, welcome to our first lab, lab one on scientific notation and powers of 10. And basically training on how to use your EXP key and your calculator and also just a teensy bit about the art of measurement and precision. These labs are loosely based off of the uh, printouts that I've provided for you, but I, I kind of make up my own rules and I go off-roading depending what I think is best for the class. So you're gonna have to follow along with me, do whatever I do and whatever I do is what you submit. So today, although I gave you three pages, probably this first page is all we're gonna get through because part of this lab is gonna involve a little bit of talking and I also wanna show you how to submit it and I wanna just lay down the rules of the road here. First things first, we do labs with pencil. We do homeworks with pencil because when you make mistakes and you scratch out, things can get a little yucky. Is that something I can ask? Does everyone have a pencil? If you have to use a pen today, fine. But when you go get your calculator, I'd like you to get a pencil. Um, other things that would be great for you to have in addition to a pencil and a Casio FX260 Solar, you're gonna wanna have a clear plastic ruler, uh, especially one that has, uh, you know, centimeters. Uh, that's fine, take your time, Ethan. Uh, I got some light issues. Something that has centimeters on one side. This will be helpful for both our lectures for making little tables and things and for small measurements in our house. If you really wanna go bonkers, if you wanna go bonkers and yonkers, Get yourself a little 
two buck compass too, or something like that. Okay, make make some pretty circles. I also sometimes have a circle maker around. This, oops, sorry, this is nice. You know, go to Jerry's Artorama, get some cool shit. Get, equip yourself. If you've got some nice tools, some nice graph paper, some pencils, and some things like this, it kind of makes doing these projects well <clears throat> not under interesting. I'm also going to change the lighting here. Hold on. That's a little better. The glare was kind of messing things up. Um, are we ready to go? More or less? Okay. Yes. Uh, so once again, the lab that we are doing can be found, if you haven't already done it, uh, in your lab tab, you are going to right click lab one powers of 10. And oops, we're going to be working from this sheet here. Uh, okay. Um, and let's go ahead and let's share to the iPhone and see if we can uh, get this right here. Sometimes it takes a second to connect. Bear with me. Okay. So, uh, Zoom. Come on, baby. Yes. Yes. Okay, this is great. This is the right tool. I should have used this for yesterday's lab as well. Let me back this thing up a little bit. This fits so light, nicely in my uh, tape deck holder. Okay. So uh, first, let's put our name down. Okay. Print your name. Um, let's put our section AS1010 colon. If you are in the day class, you are either in section 001, that's the Monday lab, or 002. If you are in the night class, you are 101, I believe. So put 101 down if you're in the night class, okay? Um, also, I think it's a really great idea for somewhere at the top of the page Let's write lab number one. And that way we keep track of which lab we're doing and which lab we're submitting, okay? That turns out to be a real smart thing to do. Can I ask that of you guys to put that down? All right. In our first section, we're gonna be multiplying some numbers in scientific notation. And the goal is for us to practice, whoa, sorry, geez. Uh, <laughs> The goal is, there we go. The goal is for us to practice using our EXP key, okay? Remember, EXP is what we use in place of times 10. So we're never gonna type times 10. We're all gonna do EXP, all right? And so we just basically wanna multiply this number, which is not in scientific notation, with this number that is. They give you some instructions here, but don't pay any attention to that. We're gonna do it our own way. The goal is that today we will put all of our final answers in proper form of scientific notation. What do I mean by proper form? Proper form means you have a lead digit, a decimal point, some numbers after it, times 10 to some power, okay? That's proper form, see what I mean? Now rounding, how many digits should you keep? is an issue that we're gonna be discussing later on in this lab. So stay tuned for the rounding part later. For now, we're just gonna to try to make sure we don't screw up the proper form. A lead digit followed by some leftover change times 10 to some power. That's what we wanna focus on, okay? All right, so let's begin. Our first problem is 2.0 times 2.8 times 10 to the five. So, uh, sorry, I'm just figuring this out here. Okay, so 2.0. 2.0 times 2.8. And instead of times 10, we're going to hit exp5 equals. So our final answer is 560,000. I want to put that into scientific notation. Um, I would like to uh, volunteer uh, Jacob. Jacob, do you think you've got the skills to put that into scientific notation for me? 
You can be honest. Come on, talk to me for a second. Is that too much? Did you kind of miss that during our lab our lecture today? No, I got I, <clears throat> Do you know what your so, lead digit is? Oh yeah, go, go for it, buddy. So I noticed there's a five above the 10. So you're gonna move that decimal digit five places to the left. Right, so let's start with our lead digit, which is five and then a decimal point, right? Is that what you meant, Jacob? Yes. Okay. And then, so five point, do we want to keep the six? Yeah. All right. And then we'll do times 10. And then what did you say the power was? To the fifth power. That's right, because you move one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that, that, that I understand you and that everyone else understands too. Um, when you're done with your answer, box it up. That's kind of a classy move. That's what Astro students do, okay? Cool. All right, thanks, Jacob. Um, next up, we're gonna tackle the negative numbers. And I wanna talk a little bit about negative numbers because I didn't have time to do that earlier. Let me get out a little pad here. Okay, this pad stuff is just scratch paper. So you don't have to write this down. You just kind of have to watch for a second, okay? Um, how do the negative numbers work? When you take a number like 10 and raise it to the minus one, that's not a negative number. That means you flip the number, right? So 10 to the minus one is the same thing as one divided by 10 to the positive one. Of course, one over 10 to the one is basically one over 10, that's a 10th. If you express a 10th as a decimal, it's 0 0.1. This is the 10ths place, if you remember from math class, right? How about 10 to the negative two? That is one over 10 to the positive two, which is one over 100. And a 100th is 0 0.01. Do you see the pattern? Every time we increment our negative power of 10, we move the decimal place one to the left. 10 to the power of minus three is one over a thousand, 0 0.001. I like to think of it this way. If I have 10 to the negative three, it means I put a one at the one, two, third place after the decimal. So for instance, 10 to the minus four is 0 0.000. And in the fourth place, I put a one, okay? I can use this fact to represent really small numbers using negative powers of 10. Uh, something I want to mention here is, do you see how I always put the lead zero before the decimal point? That's a good point of style. Never write numbers like this because it's gross. Like people don't always write decimal points. Well, always, always do a number less than one like that. Always put your lead to, uh, zero up front. All right. For instance, this number I could represent in scientific notation. What's my lead? Oh, sorry, I froze up. What's my lead digit here? Five. That's right. So I could represent this if I wanted to as 5.34 times 10 to the negative one. Okay. When we do uh, negatives in uh, negative powers, we do not use our minus key, but we instead use the negative key, which is up here above the seven. Uh, other calculators might have the negative key. Like other calculators have the EXP key here and they have the negative key there. Watch out for that. But for the most part, we wanna be using Casio. It's gonna make this a lot easier. Okay, so let's move on to the next problem now that we know how this works. So I've got 5.6 times 6.725 times 10 to the minus six. Ah, sorry guys, tape folder isn't working out so great. Okay, see if I can get the problem in the calculator on the same screen. Okay, so 5.6 times 6.725, I'm gonna use EXP for times 10, and then minus six equals. And that's what we should see in our calculator. How will I write that down on my page, Nina? Um, 
three, 3.7 times 10 to the negative five. Well, I like that you put the times 10 in. There's an issue with rounding. If you want to just keep this number, okay. it, hold on, Nina. I'm okay with rounding if that's what you want to do. What I'm not okay with is if you're going to cut the number between the seven and the six, you have to obey good rounding rules. If the number that you're cutting off is five or more, you have to increment to 3.8, correct? Yes. So Nina, it's not the rounding that was issued, it's the way you rounded. I would have accepted 3.8 times okay. 10 to the minus five. Now I am happy that you put the times 10 in. That was what I was also testing you on. So good job putting the times 10 in, but if you're gonna round, round proper, okay? Okay. All right. Let's do the next one. 3.77 EXP5 times 4.8 EXP3. So 3.77 EXP5 times 4.8 EXP3. Okay, um, Daniel, are you willing to uh, put this number into scientific notation for us? Do you wanna try? Why don't we start slow? What's your lead digit? One. Okay, let's write that down. Let's put a decimal point after the lead digit. Now, what do you want to keep? Um, let's see. Uh, at least, at least the at least the eight. Maybe the. I don't know if I should round or not for the for that first zero. Well, I don't, look, you have to keep the one. That's one yes. significant figure. Now you can keep two, three, four, or five. It's up to you. I'm gonna teach you how to round later. For now, I want you to decide, right. just make something up. All right, so in that case, let's just say, let's, let's just say keep the 8096, just to keep things simple. All right, I like it. So we'll keep the 1.8, 096 times 10. All right. Now, what's our power? Okay. Two, one, two, three, um, 10. Now, your decimal place starts here. Yes. We have moved it to between the one and the eight. Mm hmm. So we have to count the number of times it moves. Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, I was just one short. <laughs> That's okay. Just remember, it's not just counting all the digits. It's saying, where did the decimal place end up? Your decimal place ends up between the one and the eight. All right. So there's our answers. I guess I should box these if I'm going to stay consistent. All right, 5.29 EXP3 times 6.8 EXP negative seven. Okay, uh, talk to me friends. Uh, Will, what do you wanna do? Whoops, sorry, I got glitch. Well, what I did was um, I rounded uh, the five to uh, six and I said 3.6 times 10 to the negative three. I, I like that plenty good. Let's do it. Thanks, Josh. All right. If you've got that, let's move on. Uh, my handwriting could have been a little better here. I, I'm kind of holding the phone with one hand, so not quite at my best here. Okay. All right, here we're gonna do division. 9.65 EXP3 divided by 2.0. All 
9.65 exp3 divided by 2.0. Okay. Um, uh, Will, you want to do it? Yeah, so it would be, um, I'll just keep things th simple and do 4.825. Yep. On that, so 4.825 times 10 to the um, uh, third power. That's right, because you got to go one, two, three to get to where your decimal place is. Okay. All right, let's try this tricksy one 5.6 exp5 over 1.6 exp5. 5.6 exp5 divided by 1.6. Okay, Mateo, what should I do with this, Mateo? I need to put this answer into scientific notation. Oh, guys, can you just pause one second? I've got some repair people here, just uh, part of the fun. Just one, one, one moment here. I don't wanna lose this uh, screen. All right, guys. Sorry about that. I, I would have paused, but um, I've learned in the past that if I if I stop the the phone share, it gets a little janky at getting it back on. So I, and I also was very grateful for the repair folks to come. So I, you know, welcome to life at home. Okay. So all right. <laughs> um, okay. So let's get back to where I was. I was going to pick on my new friend Mateo. Mateo, what are we going to do about this? We got to put it well, in scientific well, notation. So it would, would it be just 3.5 times 10 to the zero power? Oh, beautiful, my friend. Okay. So Mateo knows that he, he already has good form. He's got a lead digit with a decimal point and a five. He hasn't moved his decimal point. So 3.5 times 10 to the zero. In other words, from here to here, he's moved at zero places. Since 10 to the zero is, uh, wait, are you guys looking at my screen? Okay. Since yes. 10 to the power of zero is one, that's basically like saying 3.5 times one. Um, obviously you wouldn't do that every day when doing your homework, but this demonstrates that any number can be put into scientific notation. Okay, let's try this next guy here. 3.2 times 10 to the nine over 2.4 times 10 to the five. So let's go ahead. 3.2 exp9 divided by 2.4 exp5. What are we gonna do with this? What do you think? So it's the 1.3 and then the little dash. On the oh, side. that's right, Mateo. All right, so Mateo, 1.3 with the little line times 10 to the what? To the four. That's right, because we only move the decimal place one, two, three, four. Okay, I wanted to make sure you got the power right, but now I want to talk about this. When you took math class back in the day, the teacher tells you if the threes go on forever, then you put a little line over it, right? Now that's fine if you're a math professor who doesn't have any real work to do, okay? Science, my friends, is concerned with the art of measurement. And measurement is a dirty job done by dirty people and their dirty little tools. And there are no such things as infinite threes forever in the real world of measurement. So we don't play those games here. We have to learn about another concept. We have to learn about measurement. We have to learn about precision and about how many threes are justified when, when we write a number down, okay? Excuse me, professor? Yeah. That's incorrect. You wrote that down wrong. Because it came out to 13 or 13333.3 three, three, three repeating. 
That's how it came out. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you explain to me what's what the issue is? Because I'm not sure I followed you. I want to understand. Wait, who, who's talking to me right you wrote, now? You wrote it down wrong. Did I? I don't feel like I did. We have a. All right, what's our lead digit? Do you agree that it's one? The number is one three 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 point three. Repeating. No, 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 no. I, I don't think you understand. I think someone's confused and I don't think it's me. Let's look at the first number that we appears in our calculator. Whatever. Do you agree that we've moved the decimal place one, two, three, four times? Yes or no? Let's start there. So how to get to the negative if we're gonna agree step by step? Uh, there is no negative. Where do you see a negative? In your work, that's why I was confused. Excuse me, I was mistaken. Okay, yeah, there was no, shoot, I lost the iPhone here. Are you guys still seeing my iPhone? I'm still seeing it's your frozen. iPhone, yes. Frozen. How many fingers am I holding up? I, we can't see it, it's frozen. Okay, all right. The screen's cool. frozen. Shit, that's bad. Uh, okay, so. Just back to the other guy who I, I couldn't see your face, so I don't know who the hell I was talking to, but it, there was no negative there, correct? It's okay if, if we misunderstand each other as long as we can figure it out. Was that your notepad? Uh, what do you mean? I'm sorry, I'm confused, hold on. Let me uh, see if I can get my screen sharing back here. Oh, damn it, it's doing that fucking thing. See, this is what, if you lose the connection, it turns into a real damn brat here. That's the one flaw of this whole, and it, it doesn't help to use that camera because it's not as good. I need this feature. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna pause until I can figure this thing out one sec. Okay, thanks to some tech support from Nina, we're on our way to getting our camera back. Meanwhile, this kind of works out because we have to have a little discussion now about measurement and precision and tolerance, okay? So in our class, we're gonna be using metric, not imperial units of measurement. So I'd like to introduce you guys to uh, the meter stick. The meter stick is kind of like a yard, except it's better because it's metric, okay? Um, when I stand tall, I'm pretty close to six feet tall, um, a meter stick goes up to roughly belt height from the ground, okay? So my leg is about a meter long. Uh, meters can be subdivided into smaller units called uh, centimeters. This is a dirty, dirty ruler. I wasn't kidding here, guys. Uh, if you guys notice here, 70, 71, 72, typically a, a, a centimeter is about the width of your pinky fingernail. The width of your pinky fingernail is damn close to a centimeter, okay? You'll see that they are further subdivided up into tiny black lines, which are kind of tough to see, and those are called millimeters. Um, this ruler, which I would encourage you to buy a cheap old plastic ruler, let's see if we can look at this uh, uh, Nina, let's see if, hopefully, is it the same thing to turn it back on again, or? Yeah, it'll be the same thing. Or you can just hit, uh, press and hold the power button. Yep, uh, it's it's turning back on, and just, every time I, it's scary, but every time I lose the connection between the phone and Zoom, I have to cycle power. You have to restart everything. And it's, if you, you can do a forced restart, and that's all three buttons, press and hold, and that'll completely restart it. Damn. You, you are just gonna, shut it down. You are my tech support guru from now on. Okay, I'm going to be counting on you. Okay, let's see if we can do this here. Uh, share. Oh, some of you are chatting me. I okay. I, I don't. Right, sorry, I'm trying to do everything here. Okay, share screen. Screen mirroring. Zoom. Here we go. All right. Thank you, Nina. All right, so here we can see some centimeters. Once again, your pinky fingernail is roughly the width of a centimeter. 
These little black tick marks that you see in between are called millimeters. Notice that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten millimeters in a centimeter. So just bear with me, guys. I'm trying to make a point here, okay? This next little lesson, which is kind of going off roading for a minute, this lesson is about something that we would call precision or what a machinist would call the tolerance of, of a measurement. Precision or tolerance is at the heart of the concepts of measurement and therefore at the heart of concepts of, of what makes science, science. Because science is nothing more, my friends, than a collection of measurements, which are faithfully reported to one another of our humans. Precisions tell us about the quality or the care to which a measurement is done. For instance, if I wanted to measure something like the length of this circle maker, I could measure it sloppily and lazily, and I could say it's close to 18 centimeters long, but I could also say, well, this ruler has gratings that are down to a, a millimeter accuracy. And by the way, let me say this, if, if one centimeter is equal to 10 millimeters, that's a conversion factor. Then it is also true that one millimeter is equal to a 10th of a centimeter. And I'm gonna to refer to those little black marks sometimes as millimeters and sometimes as 10th of a centimeters. And I don't y'all get confused on me, okay? I wanna talk about taking a measurement to a tolerance of a millimeter or a 10th of a centimeter. And we express that as my measurement will be plus or minus good to one little black tick mark. So the first time I did it, I only had a tolerance of the nearest centimeter and that's when I measured it to be 18. But now if I carefully line up my zero with the edge of the, the block there, I can see that actually uh, my measurement to the nearest uh, millimeter is 18.2. Uh, centimeters long. Now you can see it doesn't quite fall exactly on the 0.2. I guess it's pretty close, but it's a little bit over. I could try to take this measurement to the hundredths place and break the space in between millimeters up into 10 more spaces, but that might be a little extreme. For the most part, I'm just interested in what's the nearest little black tick mark. And that means I'm telling you about the precision or the tolerance of my measurement. Every number that you've ever experienced in your life whether it's the number of pennies in your bank account or the number of teeth in your head, they are all measurements and they all have a tolerance. There's a limit to how good you can measure things. It's reality, right? For instance, suppose I wanted to measure my height. I'd probably need a two meter stick, which I didn't bring with me because I didn't realize I'd be in pandemic part two, okay? So, you know, typically uh, with a two meter stick, you sort of start up here, there's one meter, and then you go up to the top. And in previous uh, experiences when I've done this, I've measured myself and I've gotten a measurement that, that would go like this, okay? So I measure my height and it's 181.4 centimeters. If I take a measurement of myself to a 10th of a centimeter tolerance, in other words, if I measure to one of these little black tick marks, this measurement has four significant figures associated with it. And that's because each one of these numbers can convey meaningful information about my height. This means I'm taller than 100 centimeters, so I'm taller than my belt, right? 180 centimeters means I'm getting close to two meters. I'm one centimeter mark over 180, and this tells you if you look to the nearest little tick mark, I'm four tick marks above the one. When you another way to look at this, instead of saying four significant figures, a physicist would say that this measurement has a precision of one part in a thousand, because to measure to a dime out of a hundred bucks 
is the same sophistication as measuring to a dollar out of a thousand bucks, okay? It means you're measuring to a thousandth part interval. When you take a measurement at the one part in a thousand level, that's a pretty sensitive measurement. And taking the measurement again might yield a different result because of things called random errors or the noise. So for instance, the second measurement of myself could next time around give me 180.9 centimeters. Now, normally I like to actually perform this experiment, but I discovered yesterday that without a two meter stick, it's really awkward to try to take a measurement to a millimeter precision if you're kind of holding the meter stick twice, it doesn't work, okay? So here I'm gonna kind of make shit up. You just go along with me. If I take two measurements of myself and I get two different numbers, which one is correct? Are they both truthful or are they both lies? What do we think? I mean, you did say there's a limit to how much, how good you can measure something. Uh, okay, but that's different here because when you take a measurement, it's better if you ask students to do this with each other because if you take a measurement with a meter stick, you can clearly see, like even on this camera lens, do you agree that you can see the nearest little black tick mark? That yes, means sir. that you are capable of judging when you, when you put a sort of second stick on your head to sort of level it out, you are capable of judging which tick mark is the closest to your head. The problem is if you do it twice, one time it lands on one tick mark and another time it lands on the other tick mark. And I'm trying to suggest to you that both of those are valid measurements and they are both the truth. Oh, uh, okay. What but, if you just have to measure the margin of error between the... Well, I'm talking about the margin of error. The, the margin of error is sort of like, well, I would say that my measurement is good to a tenth of a centimeter, right? Because that's what I'm measuring to. But these two measurements are off by half a centimeter. So I clearly don't know my height to within half a centimeter, do I? Measuring a third time could yield even a different result. The next time it might be 181.3. Presumably, if I keep measuring myself over and over again, I would get a whole list of numbers which are scattered around the truth. And I could then take the average. But watch what happens if you take the average of three numbers like this. I'm gonna add them up and I'm gonna hit equals and I'm gonna divide by three, okay? So I'll do 181.4 plus 180.9, shit, let me try that again. 181.4 plus 180.9 plus 181.3 equals, Divide by three, shit. Okay, that's not the point I was trying to make. Of course I had to pick the stupidest number here. Let's try that again. Observation error, okay. Let's take the average of these three numbers, which are all valid measurements. 181.4 plus 180.9 plus 181.2 divided by three. Now, friends, look at the number that my calculator spit out. You've taken three measurements, each to a 10th of a centimeter precision. Just because you punch them into your calculators and you do some math does not mean I suddenly fucking know my height to the hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths, hundred thousandths, millions, I don't know my measurement to one part and 10 millionth of a centimeter, right? That's like the diameter of a hair molecule on my head. I did not take a measurement that careful. And just because calculators spit out a bunch of numbers, it doesn't mean that those numbers have anything to do with the truth. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are real numbers and there are fake numbers, okay? And you've got to know the difference. Your job is to know the difference between real and fake numbers. Which of these numbers is real? How many should I be able to keep if I'm honest? It looks like you have like four sig figs or something like that. That's right. I have four sig figs in each of my measurements. 
I can keep four sig figs, but I'm still obligated to round proper. Right, Nina? So it, yeah, it would be 181.2. That's right. And that would be honest. I could say that to the best of my ability, my height is 181.2 centimeters tall, right? And, and that's called the level of precision that you have going in. They say in computer science that garbage in, garbage in equals your garbage out. Sorry, output, I don't know. Um, if this yeah. makes sense, but what are you So let's, let's talk about it then. Let's understand. No, oh, no, no, no. I understand that. I'm just like your answer. Okay. So two centimeters would be zero to two, but if you put 181.2, that's actually 1 .80, 181 centimeters would like. Yeah. One. What yeah these, that's because these, each of these were given equal statistical weighting. When I measured my height, I got a measurement down here. And I got two measurements that were closer to each other up there. So when I took the average, it ended up being that these two counted for more than that one. And that, that pushed the average over to there. That's how averaging works, if that makes sense. Like, for instance, if I had had three numbers and one was 181.1, one was 181.2, and one was 181.3, the average would end up being 181.2 because that's right in the middle. But if you lopsided it over and one is 181 point, if you have 0.1, 0 0.2 and 0.5, instead of it being 0.2, it'll average it up to like 0.3 or something. Let's find out. 0.1 plus 0.2 plus 0.5 divided by three. Yeah, it ends up pushing it towards 0.3. And watch what happens if it's even farther away. 0.1 plus 0.2 plus 0.6, this is now going to skew your average further apart, right? Now it's, just, uh, now it's actually at 0.3. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, it does make sense that your average would come out to be 181.2 because you have three valid measurements all equally weighted in probability. Taking a statistics course would help with this. Maybe you'll get to do that someday. OK. One of the cool things. Excuse me again. Sure. What does garbage in and garbage out mean? Sure. Okay. Here's what this means. Suppose, for instance, that you wanted to build the world's most gourmet hamburger. Okay. You wanted to get like one of those twenty dollar hamburgers they have at the at the at the fancy cocktail bar. So what you do is you go and you get yourself the finest Kaiser sesame bun that you can get from your local Portuguese bakery, okay? And then you go out and you grill yourself a slab of Kobe beef. And then you, you go to your local Jewish deli and you get yourself some fancy kosher dill pickles, all right? Only the top notch ingredients. And then at the last minute, you take out a Kraft Singles. You know what I mean by that, right? Like the chemical cheese that you peel out of the cellophane and you slap your craft single onto your hamburger. Is this a gourmet hamburger? No, it is not. Because you polluted your burger with chemical cheese. Now, when you are doing an average of numbers, the same logic applies. Because each one of these numbers is an ingredient in your little hamburger machine. In this case, we used all equal quality ingredients. Because there were four sig figs in my measurement, I kept an equal level of quality coming out. But if I had taken the average of different numbers, say 181.2, 180.9, and then my third measurement was 181, this number only has three significant figures. So when I took my average, I would be obligated to round down to the shittiest ingredient in my hamburger. Okay, so I would have to do, let's take the average here, 181.2 plus 180.9 plus 181 equals divide by three. So a shitload of numbers come out, but those aren't all real. I would have to round this to 181 because that's the craft single, and that is the best I can do for my measurement. 
Um, if you would like to consult this at a higher level, because professional scientists concern themselves all the time, you could use the Holy Grail or the Bible for physicists and astronomers, data reduction and error analysis for the physical sciences by Bevington and Robinson, a classic. And even at this professional level, they begin their science class just like we do with a discussion of scientific notation and significant figures. But significant figures are a little bit tricky to talk about, okay? First of all, they have a discussion here of accuracy versus precision. This data is accurate because it hovers around the true value, but it is imprecise. This data is inaccurate because it misses the true value, but it is precise data because it's reproducible. Significant figures are also important. For instance, the following numbers each have four significant figures. Well, maybe this is gonna be too much for you. You're not ready for fucking Bevington Robinson yet. Let's try this at a, at a more basic way. Okay. If I tell you that I have a thousand bucks in my pocket, I'm telling you how much money I have to a one significant figure level. I'm telling you how much money I have to the nearest thousands of dollars. Now, if you actually peeked inside my pocket and you found that I had $999.25, you wouldn't be like, what the fuck, man, you're a liar. It would be obvious to you that I didn't need to give you TMI, too much information. And that even though I had $999.25, I said, I've got a thousand bucks because I'm giving you a low precision estimate of what's in my pocket. Fine. If instead I told you that I had $1,100, this is a two sig fig estimate because I'm telling you how much money I have down to the nearest hundred dollar bill. Now you know that I do not have 1200, nor do I have $900, but you don't know how much I might have at the dollars and cents level. If I tell you I have $1,110, now I'm giving you my pocket to a C three sig fig accuracy, right? Okay, you try it now. If I tell you I have $1,001, how many significant figures does that have? Four. That's right. Four sig figs, because now the zeros are significant, because now I'm telling you what my money is down to the nearest dollar bill. If I actually had $1,002, why would I bother saying 1,001? That would just make me the psychopath or a liar. And we don't like those people. All right. So assuming that I'm an honest broker of information, when I tell you things like this, you can kind of tell how much precision I'm giving you just based on the number. One of the things I like about scientific notation is it tends to strip away the bullshit numbers and keep only the ones that count. For instance, let's imagine putting a thousand into scientific notation, one times 10 to the three. It gets rid of the non-significant zeros. But if I were to put this number into scientific notation, it would be 1.001 .001 times 10 to the three. Now I've kept all those digits of precision. When a number is in scientific notation, usually all the digits that you see recorded, all of those digits are significant. One, two, three, four. So now let's go back to Bevington and Robinson now that you have the spirit of it. And I could do the example too, but I got the idea from this book. This book is cool. So just follow along with me here and let's do some reading. For example, the following numbers each have four significant digits. One, two, three, four. Well, that's obvious, but so does 123,400. Those four are significant. 123.4 has four significant figures. Oh, wow, there's my number. 1,001 has four significant figures. 1,000 with a decimal point, that's really tricksy of them. If you put the decimal point, it means all those zeros are significant. Look at this one. 10.10 10 is four significant figures. Look at this one. 0 0.00010010 has four significant figures of which this, 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 and this are the sig figs. Those are not significant. 100.0 has significant figures. Now, there are rules, but they're hard to remember and they're confusing. 
let's see what we've learned here. Now that we've talked about precision and numbers, what if we returned back to our problem at hand? 3.2 EXP9 over 2.4 EXP5. There, sorry, I'm losing you. 3.2 EXP9 over 2.4 EXP5. Okay. How many sig figs are on the top? Two. How many sig figs are on the bottom? Two. How many do I get to keep in my answer? Two. Mateo, without putting this into scientific notation, how would I round this answer if I were to be honest with my friends? No scientific notation, just rounding. What should I round? 13,333.3. That number would have one, two, three, four, five, six significant figures. That is oh, do you, so you want just the two or so, uh, so 13,000? That's right. It's not about decimal points. If you round that number to two sig figs, 13,000. Now, Mateo, now that we've rounded proper, let's put it into scientific notation. What should be my final answer in scientific notation? So 1.3 times. times 10 to the four with no freaking line over it. Okay. That was the okay. point kind of of my entire, well, I had many points in that digression. I hope you've learned something from me. Just because calculators spit out a bunch of numbers does not mean those numbers are true. Your job is to know the truth. Your job is to know the measurement. Okay, let's try one more time. And then I think we've, we've learned for the day. We've done learning, okay? So let's try this last problem. This will be our final thing. And then I'll help you submit this thing. So we got 2.99792 EXP8 divided by 5.520 EXP negative seven. We're culminating all this together and bam, we got a big mess of crap, all right? So how many sig figs on the top? Six. Good, how many on the bottom? Four. How many do I get to keep in my answer? Four. Very good. What should this be rounded to? What should be a final answer be if I'm honest in scientific notation? 5.431 times 10 to the 14 power. Beautiful. We don't mess with the times 10 to the 14. That's sacred. Okay. So four sig figs is 5.431 times 10 to the 14. Let me say the following two things. In our class, we must use scientific notation every time a number is greater than 1 million, okay? 1 million is our cutoff. As for rounding, today I attempted to teach you how to do rounding correct so that you would know, because that's a skill that employers care about, believe it or not. But if you don't know what you're doing in this class, when in doubt, if you didn't understand me just now, always choose two significant figures and 90% of the time they'll be correct, okay? When in doubt, round to two sig figs. That's your simple rule of thumb. Now, I think this is all we had time for today. And I feel like we've kind of come to the end of a logical lesson. So this will be our lab one, just this one sheet. And this is what we're gonna turn in. And what I want you to do is I want you to take a photograph just like this, watch me now. Click, okay. And then we're gonna submit it and I'll show you how to submit it. Um, once you photographed, you will go, uh, sorry, let's navigate over to our Blackboard page. I'd actually like to have a couple of you submit so that we can all take a look at this together. Believe it or not, when we kind of, when you see it from a teacher's point of view, it will help you understand what's good and what's not good, okay? So uh, let's go here to Blackboard, uh, go to lab one powers of 10, click on that, and then uh, go to the browse local files and that's where you'll upload your image. And what I'd like to do is have you guys upload the image and let's take a look at a few example submissions and let's see how we're doing. When I grade them, I go to my grade center. By the way, please be very careful Sometimes you think you've submitted a homework 
but it gets like caught up and it glitches and it doesn't finalize the submission. And then I will not get it in my needs grading. So it's up to you to kind of go and check this out. Check it out. Cole Williamson already submitted one. Let's see if we can get a few more submitted and then we'll take a look at some samples. So you'll see here that sometimes when people are in the process of submitting, it'll say something like in progress or something. I don't know where this is. By the way, this whole thing sucks really bad. So I'm gonna be using, um, I'm gonna be using uh, Excel to keep all my records in. So don't freak out if you don't see like the good tallies and totals. I'm gonna be keeping uh, 2022, all of your data recorded here in, in my Excel sheet. It'll also be in Blackboard, but all the sums and the tallies and things I'm gonna be doing inside of here, okay? So you get a midterm score, final score, homework total. All right, let's take a peek and see if a few more people have submitted now. So let's go to needs grading again. Hmm. Um, it says that I submitted mine, so I don't know. Say, oh, okay, so what's going on here? Uh, here, let me just try to log out of the class. Oh, oh, wait, you guys are not all in the same section, are you? That's no, why I, I've got to consolidate these. So here, let's go to needs grade center. Right, a lot of people in 001 couldn't be here today, of course. Do you need uh, us to convert the picture to a PDF before we send it? William, that's nice sometimes. PDFs work great, but I'll also just take the picture as long as it's like right side up. Let's see how some of your submissions okay. look. Okay, this is great. Mateo, fucking beautiful, 10 out of 10. That's just what I want, okay? Um, let's see how the rest of them look. Trinity. Sorry, Blackboard is so horrible. Trinity, great, great job. 10 out of 10, just what I want to see, okay? I just want to see if there's anything I don't like so you guys get a sense of what that is. Uh, Daniel, looks great. Looks great, buddy, okay? So these are good. So I'm seeing the kind of thing I want. Those of you who are watching later uh, in the night class, um, let's check out Nicole's. Uh, you know, you can call me up on the phone and just talk to me. Looks great. Oh, sorry, that's Mateo's again. Um, you can just call me up if you're worried about checking things out. I look at trees. Look at Daniels. Excuse me. I'm dying here. Nicole. Let's see how Nicole's looks. Now, Nicole didn't have a printer, I guess, but she wrote the stuff out, and that's great. That's fine. Uh, Nicole, I'll warn you that some of the labs later on get a little more elaborate, so the writing of stuff out might get a little more intense. You might think of, uh, you know, printing them out somewhere like at State uh, Kinko's or something, you know? Um, okay, uh, before I end class here, so do we all feel pretty good about how this works and what I expect you guys to do? Oh, we, we don't have to do the other two sheets, like uh, the other two pages. Use class. them as kindling in your fireplace. We don't need them. Okay. That's why I only printed out the first page. Sometimes we'll use all the sheets. Sometimes we don't. Uh, I kind of change things. It depends on how fast the class is. If we had done this stuff really fast for some reason, maybe I would have tried one of the other sheets, but today I'm just fine with a one sheet operation. Okay. Now, listen. And just to reiterate, on, we have to watch the other video and do the homework by Sunday. Yeah, Mateo, I wanted to say that. Now, look, I understand that I'm imposing on you guys a little bit, but you're just going to have to trust me. It's for the good of everyone. What we want to be doing is we want to doing the first part of the lecture in labs on Mondays, second part of the lecture in homeworks on Wednesdays. It'll make so much sense. It'll be elegant. And at the end of the semester, when we're all stressed out, we won't have to come back in one more week during finals. Instead, you'll have the day off to submit. You know what it's like at the end of the semester? You guys should know that if you like you're trying to get in seven projects and you're working and the kids are screaming, it's fucking madness, right? That's when we want things to be wicked easy. Do you agree? Right now, you can suck it up. You can take it. You can watch one more video and copy the homework with me. You have until Sunday at noon. Can I ask that? If, I know everybody asked this, but it's, I can't, I hate to do this kind of shit to you guys, but it's so, I know it's so important and you're going to have to trust me. After this, we'll be doing it all together. All right. Now, listen, once more, I will post that again after I post today's video. But I want to just show you guys, uh, if you want to get going sooner for some reason, you have now done this lecture. This was the lecture zero. 
And you've also done this one, which is lecture one, part one in lab. So this was today's class right here. The thing that I want you to do for next time is here. Lecture one, part two, homework one. It's a one and a half hour lecture, take notes, and then uh, copy me for the homework. I, uh, I will post this. First, what I wanna do is I wanna post this again for today. And then I'll post that after and say, please do it. Night people are gonna be annoyed with me because their first class was supposed to be Monday, like this upcoming Monday. Special message for night people. You are gonna be grateful for this as well. Because if your class is a week behind everyone else's class, you're gonna be out of step with everyone else. If you ever miss a day because you're sick or something, you're gonna get all fucked up and you won't have a makeup class to go to. And things are just gonna suck for you and me and everyone. So I'm saving you for having to come in a whole nother night, six to 10 p.m. at the end of the semester when you're really stressed out and the weather's nice and you wanna be drinking pina coladas on the beach. You trust me, this is the right thing to do, okay? And right now I've got a little goodwill with you guys. It's the beginning of the semester. Let's, let's capitalize on it. All right, so I'll look forward to grading. Here's what I want. I want homework one and lab one. I wanna grade that for every 1010 student Sunday night when I experience my grading misery. I always do grades Sunday night. It's a horrible time for me. It causes me to drink, okay? So I want you guys to get that stuff in and torture me for Sunday at noon or noonish. I usually grade around like 9 p.m. or so, okay? And then next week we'll be doing labs on Mondays and homeworks on Wednesdays and it'll have a very nice elegant rhythm. And the beautiful thing is once we click out of here with the exception of this week, you'll never have to do stuff on your own again. No homework, no fucking term papers, just hanging out, copying, getting hundreds. Don't you like that? Great times. Okay. So uh, you guys were awesome. You were a good class. I love that you interacted with me. Um, I won't see you. Uh, you're going to do the pre-records, but I will see you on Monday. I, I, don't, I don't know why I'm not sophisticated enough to set up a permanent link, but I like to send out my link just before class starts, just like I did today by email sometime between 1120 and 1130. Okay. So look for the next link from me. Uh, Monday, it's between 11.20 a.m. and 11.30. And you know how to contact me. Call me, text me, email, whatever. I'm here to help. Anything else I can do before we end it? All right. This video will be posted approximately 5 p.m. All right. Till next time. Thank you. Have a good